Hello, we'll jump. We got audio on this too? Ooh, that's loud. Ooh, it's loud audio apparently. No Enrique fans, no? My love, my love. Anyway, we are going to try to escape the ordinary and we're gonna dive into online educational escape rooms. No, nobody, nobody gets excited about Enrique? No, just me? All right, it gets me excited. So that's my sort of face now. My hair's a little longer, I guess. But I am Sean Arnold, special educator, STEM coach in New York City's District 75. Uh, District 75 is citywide special. We do things a little different in New York all the time. Also, our pizza's better. Uh, but anyway, uh, District 75 is citywide special education. Students with higher needs disabilities, uh, a vast majority of the students have autism spectrum disorder. I, last year, was teaching fully, even when you know, most of the students in the city were remote. Our district was the first to at least partially go back in person for the students and families who wanted to, so I'm there like, you know, doing uh, socially distanced diaper changes and stuff with little bitty kids and then like run into uh, apartment buildings and, you know, sometimes shelters and stuff to help parents and things get hooked up. I, I wasn't technically supposed to, but we'll, we'll keep that quiet. The principal was cool with it. It's just we didn't tell anybody about that. Anyway, I think most of you figured it out. That's the bit.ly link as I solve for time. And I guess you can scan that QR code. All these resources, tons of templates of stuff I'm going to show you because we're going to whiz through this really quickly. And also, you know, spending more time on how to and tell the stories and all the things we're going to talk about. I am a Google innovator and trainer and now, now, a, now a coach, yippee skippy. Uh, amongst all these other fancy shiny things. But the only reason all that's important is simply because the range of my students' needs require a whole bunch of tools and techniques to you know, personalize and differentiate for the broad range of student needs. So like I said, a lot of the students have autism spectrum disorder, but we also have students with a lot of physical disabilities, but we also have students who are going to high achieving high schools in New York City and stuff, right? Um, it's awesome, but it's a lot of different things. Hopefully not all in one classroom. Uh, <laughs> that gets challenging, but to say, no one thing works for every kid, and the more you know, the more you can provide help in those ways that they need it. And in that also regard, uh, traditional talk out at people like I am stuck doing to you right now uh, doesn't really work for my students and never has, and I'd argue it doesn't work for most students either. Uh, but you have to build in all these awesome things for my students, yes, that are accessible and meaningful, but also that are engaging in, in an awesome way and intrinsically motivating, if we know what that is all about. So I love this quote, how you can really discover people and their real natures by playing with them, uh, especially if that game is probably Monopoly, right? <laughs> Anybody ever actually finished a game of Monopoly before the board got flipped over? No, no, yeah. But it's, it's true, play is powerful. Play is how we often connect at the earliest stages of our lives, and at some point we stop playing with each other. Why? I don't know. I haven't yet, but I love it. So anyway, we're going to start with a few concepts because a lot of these things, I'm going to show you how to click the buttons and do the stuff, I promise, but they never start with why and who this is about, and so I'm telling you about who I teach and who I hope to connect with and who I am as an individual and what's important to me so you can know my why for all of this, so then you can know what to do. Cool? So I think it's worthwhile to begin any of those things because something's gonna work, break and something's not gonna work and your form's gonna get all wonky and if you're like, oh, this is too hard, I give up. Unless you're incentivized that there's a valuable reason for it, you're not gonna do it. Same with any of these sessions and all the things, right? So here's a few of my whys for why we do digital escape rooms and games in education generally. Who's ever done an escape room in regular life, right? Physically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. They're cool, uh, except that I guess they get mad if you lock kids in a classroom or something like that. <laughs> Don't ask me why. They're weird that way. So uh, you have to have sort of escape rooms uh, in a more uh, way that's not going to get parents making phone calls to you. So all of these things are part of it. We need to be teaching, and that shouldn't even say 21st century skills because it's way past that. It should say future ready skills, right? Because it's all about future ready learning. I don't know if my students, some of them are nonverbal. Are they going to be in an assisted living center? Are they going to get a chance to work at McDonald's if those jobs even exist when they're like 20 years old? Uh, are they going to work at Google? Whatever it is, they're going to need to be able to communicate with other people. And maybe that's on a Zoom screen. 
For some of my students, it's on a tablet and they communicate and they're able to, or a phone that they can carry around because they're nonverbal and there's their communication device, right? And for some, it's let's have another Zoom meet thing that lasts two hours longer than it should have been, could have been an email, right? <laughs> but you're gonna need to be able to communicate. You're gonna need to be able to think critically, right? And, and solve problems and challenges that come up unbeknownst to you. You're gonna need to be creative in finding solutions. And in an escape room, that's all required, right? People who go to an escape room and try to solve it all by themselves tend to not do very well, right? And nobody's communicating with each other and then you fail and everything goes wrong. I love escape rooms, like physical ones too. You can tell when it's a bunch of teachers in an escape room too, because then they're like, to the other people who may be coming with them that aren't teachers, at a certain point they start teaching, oh, look at that over there. Maybe you should check that out. Yeah, <laughs> right? I find myself doing that even in sessions with like teachers like this where we're doing it. Like, oh my goodness, I think I see a clue, right? <laughs> but those are all the future ready skills that you're gonna need to learn. But it also is social emotional learning, right? All the sort of self-awareness of what do I understand, what do I know, and how can I share it in a relationship with others? How can I manage my time and my frustration level when I can't figure it out? Because again, and I think we know this most of us for our students, frustration is good if it's to a level that's just beyond that zone of proximal development, et cetera, et cetera. We know that stuff, right? Teacher talk. Uh, but we don't want to have too much of that, so that's why we build in maybe hints if necessary. But we also don't want it to be like, got the answers right the first time either, because what did you learn? Absolutely nothing. I already knew the answers. Skip it. That's not even learning anything at all. So yeah, we want to have a little struggle. We want to have a little management of the self while they're struggling. So these are, these are skills. These are some of the whys. This is what your escape room will consist of and the tools and things you're gonna need. We'll get into the tech in a second. Engaging stories. And again, you don't need to be a storyteller, but truly every single one of us is a storyteller. We tell stories every day about who we are, about what's important to us. I will tell you this straight off the bat, stories are the most important thing in every way you communicate with people uh, because let's say somebody has an opinion on uh, refugees or gay marriage or abortion or any such other issue that is very controversial and people have really strong opinions on. Cognitive dissonance for people or who think the world is flat. Let's, let's go with something more casual, right? <laughs> Cognitive dissonance is most easily broken through story. Studies show that not through facts, not through data, but through stories. So people who are like, let me tell you the story of a person who experienced this, right? And even if that story's not true in the term of a film or something like that, it's still more powerful than any of the data or anything. So we need to be telling engaging stories, and you can borrow the stories from whatever source you're reading, book deer with the kids, take it from a movie plot, whatever, cool, great, because they're gonna connect to it. Make it, you know, Marvel movies, there's our plot, there's our storyline, the kids love it. Right? Design it meaningfully, and all I mean about that is like, be precise in exactly what your layout's gonna be. Uh, don't make it just one thing every single time in puzzles. Like, be creative, and I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of a variety of tools. Start simply, but a whole bunch of ways you can make it. Make them all interconnected. Again, use a mix of tools because the students are gonna be learning different things. So amongst the Google tools, you might use Google Drawings, Google Slides, and I'll, I'll get into some of how those will work in a minute, and make sure that it requires a little bit of teamwork, working together. Now because these are digital, it's cool that even if you're still engaging in some remote activities or students can work independently or they can be chatting with each other in a Google Doc or a Meet or whatever while they're doing it, or let's have the conversation here while we're in class because that's cool too. All right, step one, choose a platform. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can do it in slides, in sites. I'm gonna show you to start really easily. You just need one Google form and that's all you need. All right, and we, we'll keep it really simple. Here's your prompt, your story, right? And, and with a little embedded clue. I'll give you an example in a moment. Then just create however many clues you want. I'll say when you're starting, especially with younger little bitty people, uh, three, four tops. Even for much more complex older folks that you're gonna spend time on, don't, don't go wild, six to eight, max. Um, then you can create images and resources that'll lead them to different places. The locks, which I'll show you how to do in a second. And then where is it gonna live? Is it gonna just live in the Google form? Is it gonna be on a site? Is it gonna be inside slides? Is it gonna be in another space that we love and connect to our school? And it's fine, I'll give you some options. So, let's get into the platform. Boom, again, the main ones I'm gonna say are sites, slides, and forms. But again, we'll just start with forms. We'll keep it really easily if you've never done this before. All right, 
Step one, get your story. It can be a really short story like this. It's the season of summer, and we love the weather. The warm weather comes from our closeness to a large mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace, where hydrogen is turned into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. It is also known as the, no, nobody listens to They Might Be Giants, no? All right. It is also known as the what? The sun, yay. So what we do, create a question in our Google form. Cool? This one's going to be a word lock. Most of them will be uh, just a short answer text, all right? This is a word lock because the answer is a word. It can be a series of numbers. You can make it a color lock, which is just like G for green, blue for brown, up, down, left, right. It can be directions. It can be whatever it is that works for your uh, skill set, and you're going to get to play with a whole bunch of examples. I give them the prompt that tells them three letters. Make sure they're all capitalized for this lock. And then these are the two really, really important steps. So step one, make sure it's required. You have to answer this question. Yes? Step two, you hit your little three dots. When you hit your little three dots, you click a button that says response validation, OK? This is if you've ever filled out a form and it says, that's not an email address, you liar. You forgot to put the ad and all that kind of stuff, yeah? That's, that's how that's happening. So there's different types of response validation, prove that it's a website, prove that it's an email, da, da, da. In this case, we're validating that it's an exact word, that the text contains S-U-N. So that's the only thing that will allow them to go on. And if they're wrong, the question will turn red at the bottom, and it'll give them a prompt. In this one, I'm being real clever with it and telling you're too cold. Ha ha. <laughs> and so you can be as clever as you want about it. Now, that's just one lock. And you can start with that the first time you're doing with kids. One lock to answer one question in a really fun way. Cool. Next time, two. Next time, three. Explain to them you're trying to find the answer to the clues that are in there. Now, this one clearly isn't hidden. It's literally a blank space. It can be that simple. If you want to get clever and cute with it and hide them in places and then throw in some red herring. Oh, quick question, because I used that phrase the other day. And people were like, I've never heard that before. Who, who knows what the phrase red herring means? OK. There, there's, there's not some red herring. Red herring being um, a thing that goes to a place that uh, is nothing. Rickrolled. Who knows Rickrolled? Think of it like being Rickrolled. OK, so for those of you who didn't get red herring, you might get Rickrolled. So it's like that. So some can go to those places, and they'll be like, wait, I don't know where this goes. Nowhere. It's a joke. That's part of the frustration, and we go through it. Cool. Especially if you Rickroll it. Kids will love it. So one of the examples I shared with you this is more a teacher-facing one, but I've shared other examples with you that are tons of student-facing ones across subject areas, math, science, English language arts, social studies, tons and tons of things, ones that are all about individual states. Learn all about Alaska, learn all about Texas, da 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 da, -da. right? This one is festive, though, because I grew up in the 80s for the most part, and I grew up loving video games and my Atari that eventually became like Sega Genesis and et cetera. Anyway, who loves? Carmen San Diego. Anybody remember Carmen? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where in the world is Carmen Oh, yeah. I love you people. All right. So in this example, I didn't just keep it in a Google form. Yes, all the locks are in a Google form, but that form is embedded on a website, a Google site. Fairly easy to do, but I got all the detailed instructions on how to make that happen inside the thing. Oh, look, we got a story at the top. Cool. I love having it in both video and text, if possible for accessibility reasons. So if I need a screen reader and I'm visually impaired, cool, I can have it read to me. But videos are fun and cool, so it can be a YouTube video that you posted, or it can be in your drive right? that you post to the site that tells your background story. So for example, in this one, it's sort of Tron-like. I kind of borrowed from Tron. And you get sucked into the video game world, and you have to escape. And so we got tons of clues embedded. And you see at the top of the site, we got links to different pages. That's how we set it up so they can see, and each one's named the kind of thing that they're learning about, about different games. Hey, look, there's games for assessment, creativity games, coding games, da 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 accessible games that I want them to learn about. And they're seeing things that are Google Drawings that have embedded links in them that might take them to other clues. They're finding things that are slide decks that might have information hidden in the corner of the bottom page that's maybe a little letter at the bottom if they notice it right, in a different color. It might be a link to a Google Doc that looks blank because all the text is white. 
and maybe they got to figure out. Or maybe it's a Google Doc because I want them to explore languages because in New York City we have more than 200 languages spoken. So I want them to explore and, and access Google Translate and they'll see, well, maybe they don't speak Portuguese and they don't know what bon dia is. You know, it's a good day, hello everybody. Right? So cool, all the different ways you can embed those clues and those are available, you can start playing them right now, you can play them later, you can ignore me and just keep playing, that's fine. And there's links to, in this particular one, learning information in which I wanna take them to other places. Now that's usually at the bottom of the page, say additional information, so they know it's not part of the game, I'm not messing them up too much, but just so, hey, if you wanna learn more on this topic that we're studying, there it is, there you can go. Here's another one, an EdTech adventure where I'm taking through a bunch of teachers through EdTech technology tools. Again, a storyline where you go to the land of EdTechlandia, right? And you know, explore the different archipelago islands of it, assessment archipelago, isle of discussion, where they're learning discussion platforms, they're learning assessment tools like Edpuzzle and Google Forms that are taking them through different links. Hey, look, there's embedded colors maybe on, on uh, the Flipgrid videos or here inside of other created elements that we've got, you can create custom tickets for things, or you can create images. And I've linked all these to you so you can make them and I'll show you some other examples. Create custom maps. And create custom games if you're diving that deep advanced in Scratch, right? All right, so Google tools to make the clues. My favorite ones are Google Drawings and just general Google Translate docs and things like that. I told you about the translation. If you didn't know, inside of a Google drawing, you can stick an object on top of another object on top of another object, right? And maybe it looks like it's hidden because it's a circle hidden inside the sun, but embedded in that is a link. Now maybe I, I link them to the Google drawing or I download it as a PDF and link it to them in the drive. And it takes them like searching around with their little mousey clicker thing to figure out, oh, I can click on that. Maybe the image is in black and white and one little piece is in color is a clue to let them see it. So that's a cool place to do it. I love doing it in Google Drawings. Um, but anything can do it. Just use some hyperlinks. Just change the fonts around as part of a clue. Bold text, all capital letters, helps out. Anything like that will work. Formula and Autocrat are if you want to get a little more advanced where they start filling something out in a form and it creates answers and images if they answered it correctly in the form. It's, an, it's a little more complicated, but the instructions are, are there in the guides. Conditional formatting is good, creating colors inside of a, a spreadsheet, like sheets, you know, little function things that'll automatically make it go somewhere and do something when you want it to happen. Again, I know sheets is nobody's favorite stuff for the most of the time. I love a good spreadsheet. We can have conversations later. I'm a nerd that way, but cool thing to do. But even beyond the Google tools, there's more stuff you can use. Hey, visual things inside of Canva. I'm linking you to class tools. There's a whole bunch of stuff, but there's a bunch of activities I link you to, like cipher wheels, so you can create cipher wheels. Jigsaw planet, all right? Create jigsaw puzzles. You got an image, and the clue is that they basically gotta solve the puzzle to create the image and get the information that they need that's gonna lead to the lock, right? Oh look, breaking news generators, all these generators, acrostic generators, tons of cool things, generating those tickets like I showed you, all those cool kinds of things. Generate a fake tweet, right? I don't know, maybe that's not meaningful for the kids. A fake TikTok post, right, cool. So all sorts of things that you can do to make it more visually compelling. So where can we go with this now? Uh, there's a whole bunch of adventures you can take them on. So just think about it. Where is it you want your students to go? What is it you want them to learn? What would be enhanced? Because I'm a, I'm a STEM guy. So like, you know, math, the way we teach it 95% of the time is straight trash. Um, that's a longer conversation that we can have, but drill and kill is terrible and you should never be doing that. And there's good quality ways to teach math and playful games are one major way to do it. Yes, hands-on, tactile stuff as well. Uh, but just think about the math adventures you can go on that are awesome. Or if you teach social studies, or if you teach science, or if you teach art, or whatever it is you teach, cool, think of that activity. And I've got links to ongoing learning that you can get to in the Google Teacher Center that'll take you through it. A bunch of Google educator groups if you wanna come hang out in New York City at some point and watch some Broadway shows with me, go ahead, message me, and we'll make it happen, and you can come hang out at one of our gigs. Um, I got some videos and blogs and PLMs, and if you didn't get that link yet, do it now. You got five, four, three, oh, two, bit.ly, ISTE, escape, capital letters matter, sweet. I think everybody got it? No? 
Yeah? Oh. All right. Well, they're telling me that's my time. Uh, I hope you got it. But to that end, there we go. I just hope whatever you're doing, it's not always going to be immediately successful in any of these games or the new things you create. But you can always be brave in every attempt, which is my point. And, and again, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. If possible, let me know. Uh, but I hope this was helpful for you. Cool, cool, cool. Hope you had fun. And go ahead and play the games I link you to. Feel free. That's the best way to experience it. Go ahead and play them.